This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. At sundown, one sweltering evening in the late summer of 1200 BC, on the Adriatic coast, a boat's prow grinds on the sand as the vessel is driven onto the beach by the desperate crew rowing with the last of their strength. The captain, a veteran warlord from the north, clings to the curving stern post with its carved bird head, scanning the horizon for sign of their pursuers while his men hunch over their oars, panting for breath. Shielding his eyes from the light of the setting sun, he squints at the open water between the islands offshore and wonders if this last turn of speed was enough. If his gods are with him, he knows he will make it home in six days. But there are other gods, he thinks. Gods he may have angered by his actions in that foreign land. When the last warmth of the sun vanishes from the earth and no enemy ship has appeared beyond the headland, he makes a decision. He will hide a portion of his treasure here, on this desolate coast, between the sands of the beach and the rocks of the high hills inland. And he swears to his ancestors that one day, if the gods are with him, he shall return to retrieve it. But he never did. That treasure would lay hidden beneath the earth of Makaska for over 3,000 years before it was found. But who were these people? Where had they come from? And what exactly was the treasure that they buried? This is the story of Bronze Age Pirates and Tomb Raiders. Bronze Age trade in the Aegean and Central Mediterranean was dominated by the Minoans from Crete before the Mycenaeans took it over in about 1500 BC. But there were other maritime experts, especially those from Cyprus, which was a trading hub specialising in copper. There were regular shipments in all directions of copper and tin, pottery, timber and resin, glass and amber, weapons, tools, armour, jewellery, food and spices. This trade, carried out over land but especially by river and sea, was vital to the Bronze Age way of life. Virtually everything made or used by humans travelled in some way by watercraft, which allowed cultures to interact over vast distances through exploration, trade, warfare, piracy and migration. Militarily, ships could be used as mobile fighting platforms during battles, but more commonly they served for coastal raiding and as naval transports for men and supplies. It is impossible to understand the Mediterranean Bronze Age world without taking into consideration the influence of ships and seafaring. A famous insight into the maritime situation in the Late Bronze Age is provided by the Ulibarun shipwreck, sinking off the southern coast of Anatolia in around 1300 BC. It was probably built in Canaan, and it was sailing westwards with its cargo towards Mycenaean Greece. It carried 10 tonnes of Cypriot copper and a tonne of tin, which would together have made 11 tonnes of bronze, and it contained other raw materials and manufactured items. There's also the Cape Gelidonia shipwreck from about 1200 BC, which again carried a cargo of Cypriot copper oxide ingots and broken bronze implements meant for recycling, and items associated with bronze working. The ship itself may well have been from Cyprus, considering how much of the material it carried, like the pottery and even the ship's anchor, originated on the island. Who controlled all this trade? Certainly great kings controlled much of it. They had the resources to build and crew vessels, and to exchange their surplus goods for what they wanted from foreign lands. Trade was a means by which to exert their political power within their own realm and in foreign relations. They also had the power to protect their vessels from enemies. Certain settlements and palaces were located in strategic positions that enabled their rulers to control the local waterways and they employed their warriors as guards on the ships to protect the cargo, crew, and the vessels themselves. There were not only great kings and grand palaces, however. Smaller settlements and lesser rulers on countless islands of the Aegean and the rocky coasts of Anatolia carried out their own trade as best they could on smaller ships and in shorter voyages. But these trading ships and their valuable cargo were also preyed upon by pirates. To become a Bronze Age pirate, all you needed was a ship, a crew, and a base of operations. 
Where might the pirate ships come from? Well, they were all over the place, from small fishing vessels to the 10 meter long Cape Galadonia trader up to the 16 meter Ulubarun vessel. And no doubt there were ships even larger than that. These kinds of trading ships could be taken in port, taken while at anchor in one of the countless harbours, or they could have been built to order and paid for specifically for the purpose. But there were other kinds of ships too. The most successful was the Mycenaean style oared galley, sleeker and swifter than the trading ships. These were the vessels used to impose order and they were ideal for raiding and warfare. These galleys were the ships used by the Sea Peoples, shown on the Egyptian reliefs at Medina Harbu. In order to understand how Bronze Age piracy would have worked, some researchers have looked at examples of pirates around the world in historical times, from the Caribbean, the South China Sea, North Africa, and in the Mediterranean during the Classical era. Historical pirates were often also traders, Sometimes a trading voyage might prove unsuccessful as a commercial venture, leaving a crew to be paid and months of labour unrewarded. And so the owner of the boat, the owner of the cargo, the master of the ship or the crew collectively might decide to take by force what could not be traded for. We see this kind of behaviour in the Vikings of the Middle Ages and amongst the English trader pirates of the early modern period, like Sir Francis Drake. No doubt some Bronze Age pirates switched back and forth between trade and piracy, while others committed fully to the raiding life. Remember, this was an era when the armed raid was not necessarily regarded as a criminal activity. In fact, it was fundamental to the way of life of the Indo-European aristocratic warrior. From around 1300 BC onwards, warriors from Central Europe spread ever further through the Aegean and the Mediterranean. We know this from the appearance of their weapons and personal items from Northern Europe to Syria and Egypt. Many of these men served as the retinue of powerful foreign overlords, guarding ships and trade routes and ports. But with the breakdown of order in the Mycenaean world and the collapse of the palaces and the kings who ruled them, these warriors were turned to a life of piracy. Some of these pirate groups of former mercenaries would be remembered as the Sea Peoples. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, a subscription-based streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals you can't find anywhere else. It's the world's first streaming service dedicated entirely to learning, with categories including history, science, nature, technology, society, and lifestyle. Just like other streaming services, you can watch Curiosity Stream on all your devices. And best of all, you can get access to all of it for 25% off an annual subscription. That's just $14.99 for the whole year if you sign up using my link. There's so much to watch on this service that I've been spoiled for choice. Recently, I've been watching Bronze Age, a three-part series charting the birth, peak, and collapse of Bronze Age society as well as loads of other great documentaries on the domestication of dogs, on colonising Mars, and much more. Follow the link in the video description below, or head on over to curiositystream.com forward slash Dan Davis, and use the promo code Dan Davis for 25% off your annual subscription. Now let's journey back to the Bronze Age Mediterranean. The Sea Peoples were multi-ethnic groups of warriors and disenfranchised or displaced peoples from around the Mediterranean who engaged in piracy and attacks in the Aegean and the Near East. They included individuals who served as mercenaries in various late Bronze Age kingdoms, with some eventually migrating to and settling in Anatolia, Cyprus and the Levant. As in historical eras, it is likely that as they moved around the region, they acquired additional followers from the places they were in contact with and, when settling down, they intermixed with various indigenous groups forming new cultures. This is what happened with the Peleset, who over time became the Philistines. The researchers looking at historical pirate groups found that they are often multi-ethnic in origin, but quickly develop a distinct culture of their own. They tended to have a somewhat flat social hierarchy based on the regular distribution of wealth, dividing up the spoils as shares. Feasting 
the communal consumption of food and alcohol was the most common pastime after the piracy itself, and they had to have secure home bases away from central authority. These tended to be islands or remote coastlines where they could pay off the local chiefs, or the local chiefs could have been pirate leaders themselves. And these patterns of historical pirate activity are also seen in the Bronze Age Mediterranean. The shared material culture is seen in the spread of the now to style slash and thrusting sword, Urnfield style cloak pins, and a kind of Mycenaean pottery associated with feasting. We can imagine Bronze Age pirates feasting like Homeric heroes, roasting cattle over fires on the beach, and boiling meat in vast pots to be fished out with flesh hooks, because of course Homeric heroes were themselves committed pirates and coastal raiders. The Sea Peoples used Mycenaean style galleys, but that doesn't mean all the Sea Peoples were Mycenaeans. It may instead reflect the dominance of the Mycenaean style of war galley in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean. Still, it does reinforce the links between Greece and the Sea Peoples. An example of a pirate base is Mar Paleocastro on Cyprus, which occupied an isolated but easily defensible promontory with good views of potential targets out to sea, and a tower and a fortification wall that was built and occupied for a relatively short period between about 1200 and 1150 BC. The cultural core of this site was Mycenaean, but there were Aegean and Cypriot style buildings and local Cypriot, Canaanite, Aegean style and Italic pottery here. As well as its somewhat multi-ethnic nature, the geography in the form of a defensible promontory with good views of potential targets made it a prime site to launch attacks on shipping. Pilakokina Kremnos was another short-lived settlement on Cyprus, occupied for just 10 years between about 1200 and 1190 BC. Again, it mixes Aegean and Cypriot traditions. The houses were built next to each other, so their backs formed a protective wall, a strategy employed on the Greek island of Kimolos, and thus Pila was another mixed community where a conscious defensive strategy was employed to protect the inhabitants against pirate activity during this catastrophic era. Its short existence suggests they were ultimately unsuccessful. There's another fascinating phenomenon taking place in this era of decline and collapse related to these seaborne pirates and raiders, and it shows up in the archaeological record as a kind of pirate treasure. From the Late Bronze Age, archaeologists start to see the appearance of chronologically and geographically out-of-place objects in what would otherwise be contemporary hordes. There are many examples of this phenomenon. One is the clay Kernos from Tomb 122 at Parati in eastern Attica, a Cycladic vessel originally from the island of Milos and dating to the early Bronze Age, but found more than 130 kilometers across the sea from Milos in a tomb whose contents otherwise belong to the early 12th century BC. And there is the Tyrin's treasure buried in a pit in the lower town at Tyrins from the 12th century BC. It contains an extraordinary chronological and geographical mixture of items, including a gold signet ring that dates back at least as far as the 15th century BC, gold earrings or pendants in the form of bull's heads of a type well known in Cyprus, and amber and gold wheels, which find the best parallels for their amber bead type in Italy, the Eastern Alpine region, the Adriatic, and as far east as the Ukraine in the 12th to 11th centuries BC, and for their gold wirework in Central Europe. This treasure also contains a Cypriot bronze tripod stand, an iron sickle or knife also likely to originate in Cyprus, a Hittite cylinder seal, and two bronze swords of the European Urnfield now two type, as well as a bronze slab ingot, a bronze sickle, seven bronze vessels, the broken off supports of a couple of bronze fire dogs, fragments of gold and ivory and more. So what's the explanation for all of this? Well, chronologically out of place objects like these are often interpreted as heirlooms, which makes sense because objects were certainly passed down through the generations. A famous sword or helmet passed from father to son, for example. But in some instances, this explanation is implausible. 
Look at the 800 years between the creation of the Cycladic Kurnos from its final resting place at Parati. Perhaps it did remain in circulation all that time, but it seems unlikely. And it's possible that the gold signet ring from the Tyrian's treasure was an heirloom passed down for hundreds of years. But considering the geographically very mixed nature of the treasure as a whole, there might be another explanation. There are also many metal hoards found in the eastern Mediterranean, the Aegean, north of the Alps, and around the Adriatic as well as in Italy. These tend to date from the Late Bronze Age collapse into the Early Iron Age. Metal hoards are collections of metal objects that were buried for some reason only to be discovered in modern times. Why would people bury collections of valuable metal objects in this way? Well, speaking generally, some might be buried as offerings, deliberately sacrificed to honour a god or to mark a special occasion, and some might have been buried to hide them temporarily, perhaps for safekeeping, the owner intending but failing to return to dig it up again. These hoards from around the 13th century BC often contain objects several generations or even centuries older than the most recent objects they're buried with and may also contain objects from distant lands. A particularly interesting example of a metal hoard which contains both geographically and chronologically anomalous objects is that known as the McCasker Hoard now in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. It was originally part of the collection of John Evans and was given to the museum by his son Arthur Evans, the archaeologist famous for his work on the Minoans. The hoard consists of two flat axes, two chisels, a spear butt, a large hammer, two shaft hole axes and a miniature oxhide ingot. When the hoard was first properly examined by archaeologists in the 1970s, some expressed doubts about the find place of the hoard. One noted that none of the objects would appear out of place in a Cypriot context. Another agreed, hypothesizing that the hoard in fact derived from 19th century excavations of Cypriot tombs and that the place on the Dalmatian coast had been mistaken for a site in Cyprus with a similar name. Actually, they were wrong and the evidence shows it was obtained in what's now Croatia. So how did all these Cypriot objects end up there? Well, of course, one way is trade. Cypriot objects, including ceramics and metalwork, have been identified in southern Italy, Sicily and Sardinia from the 13th century BC onwards. And hoards like these are evidence of a circulating bronze scrap trade on a small scale and at high frequency throughout the Mediterranean. Traders would include bronze scrap and raw ingots along with other goods on their journeys. There were also likely traveling bronze workers who accompanied ships or regularly moved to where their services were needed. This is well evidenced by the Cape Geledonia wreck we discussed earlier. But the Makarska hoard also contains shaft hole axes that are 500 years older in date of a type from the Middle Bronze Age in Cyprus. And archaeologists can tell that tombs of the Middle Bronze Age in Cyprus were opened in around 1200 BC. And so we can conclude that these Cypriot tombs were raided for the bronze artefacts within. Whether the people who buried the Makarska hoard were the same people who raided the tombs of Cyprus for the contents, we can't say. Perhaps the contents were obtained through trade with the tomb raiders, or perhaps the raiders were themselves the victims of piracy. Raiding tombs was an obvious way of obtaining wealth from a land you had conquered and controlled, even temporarily. But tomb raiding was about more than that. Tombs from all over the world show evidence of being plundered in ancient times. In fact, it's a wonder that anything at all survived in these tombs until today. Because it wasn't just about taking the material wealth within. When barrows and cemeteries were plundered, and renowned prestige goods and weapons were carried away, it was a means of inflicting yet another humiliation on your enemy. You were defeating not only your enemy, but your enemy's ancestor heroes, in effect killing them again, stripping them of their weapons and the material signs of their honour. You could defeat a people in the present, but to really destroy them, you had to wipe out their links to their ancestors. They would no longer be remembered, and thus it would be as though they'd never existed at all. This explains the recurring plundering of barrows and cemeteries in the Bronze Age, and the appearance of ancient grave goods from unrelated cultures 
being buried by pirates returning to their bases. The Makarska Horde was buried on the Adriatic coast in a place protected by a maze of islands close to the shore. Perhaps this was a pirate base. Perhaps the captain of this ship was heading back to northern Italy or even to central Europe after a season of piracy and tomb raiding in the Aegean. Whatever the truth, this horde and others provide a remarkable snapshot of the period. Foreign raiders living on the wealth of earlier ages, taking precious gold and silver objects and ancient bronze tools and weapons and hacking them into pieces or melting them down for the raw materials. Ships of traders and raiders and pirates sailing the Mediterranean, transporting goods and people. The great demand for metal and wealth, as well as the desire for fame and glory, drove many to raid not only the foreign peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean, but also the houses of their dead ancestors. This channel depends on your support. If you enjoy these videos, please join us on Patreon for as little as $3 a month and unlock the exclusive content there. Now, to find out about a specific conflict in this era, watch this video on the Tolentz Valley Battlefield, the earliest battle known archaeologically. Thank you for watching.